Hey, can, we, can we do something for a second? Can we let all those watching online know that we love them so much? And we're so grateful that you're watching. Hey, if you're, if you're watching online and you're watching from health reasons, we're so glad that we can provide a service for you. But if you are watching from habit reasons, meaning you just haven't come back to church because you built a habit of, throughout the quarantine of watching online, we want to invite you back to church on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. Our church is back, so we'd love to see you back here at the gathering on Wednesdays. Is anybody looking forward to the, to the, to the message tonight, Make Room? Anybody loving this series, Make Room? Come on, Devin Fry came last week and brought a message, and um, I'm excited to preach. If you don't know me, my name is Caleb, and, and it's an honor. Honestly, it is like a pr- the greatest privilege and honor. After knowing Jesus and after being married to the best wife on planet Earth, Stacy, come on, shout out to my wife who is br- like, are you kidding me? Where is she at? A powerful worship. And, and then maybe after being a father to my children, this is like the greatest honor and privilege of my life is to uh, serve you, and honestly, I'm just a part of this community. If I was not the pastor of this community, I would just be here every single week because I love it so much. Anybody else you love? You love the gathering? Like, so here's the deal. Um, let's, let's make a commitment. Before we even get in the message, let's make a commitment to keep bringing people into the house of God on Wednesday nights. Like, I want to commission you, be an inviter. Be someone that comes with a whole army behind you. Be someone every week, you're like, I don't know who's coming, but I know that there's people going to come because I am going to be inviting people to the gathering. I want you to come and be like, hey, that whole front row section reserved for me and my friends because we bring an army behind me. Be an inviter. Someone, someone say amen and get loud for that, why don't you? We're in a series called Make Room, and the whole idea of this series is that we would genuinely make room for the mission of God, which is to get the good news, the message of Jesus, to all those who need to hear it in the spheres of life that we find ourselves. I mean, you don't have to go on a missions trip long-term overseas for a couple years to make an impact for the gospel. You can do it right in your neighborhood. You can do it in your school. You can do that in your workplace. And that's what this whole series is about. It's about making room uh, for the gospel to be what we prioritize. Um, I'm getting some weird like stuff with this microphone. We could fix that. But I want to preach a message tonight, and I'm real excited. It's going to come from my heart. And so I hope that you would, we like to be passionate and participative with the messages. So just don't get too quiet on me tonight. You're going to make me nervous if you get too quiet. So make some noise. Yeah, 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 yeah. Make some noise tonight. Um, If you have your Bible, we're going to go to Mark chapter two. Mark chapter number two. And we're going to read verse one through 12. We're going to read 12 verses tonight. We're going to read some Bible. And then I have some uh, words to say about the scriptures. Does that sound good? Um, Verse number one, Mark chapter two. When he, Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Now, it's likely that this wasn't his home. This is probably Peter's home. And so he's, but he's crashing at Peter's home. Like he's He's, he's, he's making, his, making room at the house, you know, for himself. And so he's there at the, at, at the house. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room. Someone say make room. There's no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. This is what Jesus did. He, he would gather people and he would preach the word and he would perform miracles and he would do crazy things. And so it's just doing what he was doing. Verse number three, and they came, and they, they came, they came, they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, check this out, they removed the roof above him. No one reacted, but they removed the roof. If you grew up in church, you heard this story in church, and the, the four friends brought the paralyzed man and they lowered him through the roof. They, this is destruction of property that we're talking about here. They removed the roof of the house that they were in, and the Bible says when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, someone say their faith. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is, he is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Jesus is a savage. He's like, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're saying. Why are you questioning me? Okay. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything quite like this. We've never seen anything like this. What, a, what an awesome text that we have tonight. Let's pray. And then we're going to take the next uh, three hours to preach. All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you so much, and we just thank you in this moment that, God, you still work miracles. You still work miracles. Like, if there was a paralyzed person here, you could raise them up from their bed. You could heal them. But, God, the greatest miracle of all is the fact that you look at humanity in our sins and in the stains of our sin and the brokenness of our sin, and you say, I forgive you. That's the greatest miracle of all. So help us, Lord, to unpack this and see this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, why don't you give Jesus a rowdy shout of praise? No, give him a shout. Come on, I love that Jeff said, take 20 seconds. Give him a shout of praise in this room. My first sermon ever, my first sermon ever. Um, I slightly remember my first message that I ever gave. I usually tell the story that my first message ever was when I was 16 years old and I stood before a men's breakfast because that's where you try out all the young preachers. You, you throw them at the men's breakfast. And so I, I preached my first message at the men's breakfast. But really, my first message, my first sermon ever was actually way before when I was 16. I was five years old when I preached my first message. Now, it's told to me, this story is told to me, and I slightly remember this, but five years old, and, and, and this is the first message I ever preached. I did not have a microphone in my hand. I did not have a platform on which I was standing. Um, there, there really was only two people in the audience that I had, but I still preached my first sermon at five years old, and the sermon was very simple. I had one of my friends over my parents' basement, and we were hanging out in my parents' basement. Now, what you need to know about the basement is that half of it was our playroom. This is on Oak Street in Halifax, Massachusetts. Half of it was our playroom, and the other half of it was my dad's administrative assistant office because he was running a contracting business, a painting and renovation business. So someone would work in there and half of the other space was for our play. And so I had a friend over named Nate and we were playing in the playroom and, and I, I did not know that there was someone, my dad's assistant was in the office overhearing um, what we were saying. And so, so I, I'm with our friend, we're playing with toys and stuff. And, and I randomly asked my friend, my first, my first sermon ever, ever preached. I said to my friend, it was a question. Do you believe in Jesus? To which my friend replied, yes, I do. And I said, good, because if you didn't, you'd go to hell. <laughs> that was my first, come on, give it up for my first message I ever preached. Five years old. And I tell that story and um, along the, the way, I, I learned maybe some, some delivery tips and maybe some tactful ways to communicate the message of the gospel just a little bit better than when I was five years old. But my question for myself in this week, I was genuinely asking myself, was my message more clear at five years old than it is at 25 years old? Was I more bold at five than I am at 25? I'm serious, I was pondering this question just the other day, and, and sometimes I think that it's easy to get caught up in this fluffy message that where we, we, we avoid the real thing that Jesus came to save us from, which is an eternity separate from God. And, and this is the message that we preach. By the way, it's called the good news. 
And, and I love that we have, I was sharing this with the growth track class. I, it's funny to me. It's comical that we have some t- so often preachers. And I grew up in the church. I was at church all the time growing up. And I think it's so interesting that we've had so many preachers that bang on the pulpits and got veins popping out and have the most angriest face on planet Earth when they're preaching the good news. It's, it's the good news. It's the best news that we could ever communicate to a human soul is the fact that you can live and have eternal life with your Savior forever upon faith in Jesus Christ. It's by grace through faith that we are saved. This is our message. It's the message that we preach. And it's time. Gathering family, please listen to me. It's time that we stop playing church games. It's time that we stop doing this in and out kind of thing that we do with our church and church life and spirituality. I'm here to tell you that the church is not a country club that we come to, clap our hands, sing some songs, and then walk out unchanged and doing nothing with our faith. The church is so much better than that. The church is actually the representation of the living God on planet earth to say to all those who would listen, come, whoever will come. It doesn't matter how broken you are. It doesn't matter how messed up you think you are. If you come and you have faith in Jesus, you, my friend, can be saved from your sin. This is the good news. It's the gospel. And our mission, and our mission is that we would take this news to all those in our in our in the spheres of influence that God has given you, that you would take this message to, to your friends, to your coworkers, to those you have relationships with, that people around us would see, not just hear, but see Jesus in us and experience the message that he was crucified for our sin and that he rose again from the dead. I am done playing church games. Is anybody else sick and tired of just doing church? We are the church. What does this have to do with this story? Well, the first thought I have tonight, if you want to, by the way, my title tonight is is five-year-old faith. Five-year-old faith. I want to get back to the, when I was five years old, I just wanted my friend I wanted my friend to know that, I, and I wanted my friend to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Five-year-old faith. See, sometimes I think, I think we all think we need more intellectual and apologetical arguments for faith. We need, we need to study. We need to make sure we have all the right points of theology to argue those who reject the faith, that we would get it all of our theological and doctrinal ducks in a row, all of our apologetics, everything that we need to know to, to convince and win the argument that, that someone would bow their knee to Jesus. And all those things are important. But I'm here to tell you, maybe we just need more five-year-old faith to reach our friends for the gospel. Maybe it doesn't require a theological seminary degree to win your friend to Jesus. Maybe it doesn't require a microphone in a platform to win your friend to Jesus. Maybe it just requires a boldness and authenticity and some childlike faith to say, Will, do you believe in Jesus? Because if you do, it's not that you just will not go to hell, but it's that you will receive eternal life and have a brand new life here on earth in Jesus Christ. Come on, church. We have the good, the good news. If you want to win your friends to Jesus, like this, the four friends, the four men that were carrying carrying the paralyzed man to Jesus, I'm looking out and and I love the faces that I'm seeing because I know I'm like, Man, these people, they want to win their friends to Jesus. They want to be like the paralyzed. They want to be like the the, the men who were carrying the paralyzed man. And and they want to do whatever it takes to bring their friends to the person and presence of Jesus. And if that's you, I want to speak to all of those who would say, yes, that's me. I want that. I want to speak to you tonight. I want to help you come alongside you as you tell, share your faith with your friends. And my first thought is this is why don't you start there? Why don't you start with your friends? Start with your friends. I love the text in Mark 2, 3. It says, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. 
So these four guys are like, all right, we hear about Jesus. We hear about his miracles. We hear that he does uh, incredible, miraculous things. Like he, he's, he's opening blind eyes. He's casting out demons. He's, he's, he's people that couldn't walk are walking. So they're like, friend, we are going to do everything in our power to bring you to Jesus. These four guys started with their friend. They're like, we're going to do what it takes to bring our friend to Jesus. And my, my first thought tonight is that you would maybe just start with your friends. Now, here is a fallacy a lot of us believe. I don't have influence. Okay? A lot of us believe the lie, I don't have influence. We believe if we don't have enough social media, Instagram, TikTok followers, I don't have influence. If, if I don't have a stage and a microphone and somewhere to shout from, I don't have influence. Influence. If I'm not the most popular kid at work or school, then I don't have influence. I'm here to tell you that every single person in this room, if you have a pulse, if you are breathing, you have influence. Okay? You have influence. And I know you have influence because you have people most likely living in the same house as you do. You have people that you're with and around every single day. You have a school that you go to, a college campus that you go to. You have a workplace that you're at pretty much every day. Let me say this. If, if you are someone that doesn't believe you have influence, you just need to look around a little bit longer. And you'll realize quickly you have influence and you have a friendship circle. And I'm here to say this, okay? Listen to me. You actually might have more influence, probably have more influence than I have over your friends. You most definitely have more influence over your friends than I have influence over your friends. I, I'm a preacher. I have a microphone. We meet every week. But you have more influence than I do over your friends. And I hope that you would say, you know what? I want to win my friends to Jesus. And maybe it's just this. Maybe, it's, maybe you just need to start with your friends. In fact, I think some of us, we wait for a fan base. We wait for fame to think we can do something great for God. No, you just, if you got friends, you can do something great. I remember getting saved at 15 and everything changed. And I've told my story many times to you. But it was like, man, my, my dad handed me a book called Passion for Souls. I forget who the author is, but my dad handed me a book. And in, in it, it, it disclosed in the book was, was just this whole story after story of people coming to Jesus. And, and, and this, this author was just so fiery and passionate about souls being one to Jesus because he, he realized that, man, eternity is at stake here. And so, so I, I caught a fire and a passion for souls. And I never looked back when I was 15 years old, reading the pages of this book called A Passion for Souls. And I'm telling you this, I went to my friends, friend after friend after friend, 15 and 16 and 17 and 18 years old, friend after friend, sat him down, got lunch. Hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you what he's done for me, shared my testimony. Maybe someone in the room needs to start with your friends, just like these guys did. I want to help you out for a minute. I want to help you. I want to help you do this. I want to give you some practical things. But before I do, I want to share a really quick story. There was a pastor that moved from Texas to New Hampshire. And this pastor, um, on the first Sunday that he was preaching at the church, he stood up on the platform and he said to the audience, I think there was about uh, 120 people there. He said to the audience, he said, in just one year, we are going to see this church double in its size. In one year, we're going to see double the amount of people that are here tonight. We're going to see double them coming in one year. And, and he said, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to do it. Pray for one. Why don't you say that back to me? Pray for one. Come on, say it with me. Pray for one. This was his strategy. He said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for each one of us are going to pray for one person and we're going to pray for them. And we're also going to pray that God opens the door of opportunity that we could share our faith and, and do acts of love toward that person and maybe just maybe God would answer our prayer and they would give their life to Jesus and they too would be included in the kingdom of heaven. He said, we're going to double the church. If everyone agrees, we're going to pray for one and we're going to wait for that one. We're going to take, we're going to pray for opportunities to share our faith with the one. And when that 
happens, we're going to take that opportunity and they're going to be invited into the kingdom of heaven. I, th- I believe it was true that after one year, the church didn't just double, but it tripled. Because this is what discipleship is. We pray for people that don't know Jesus, that, that they would know Jesus, and we take every opportunity that is presented to us that we could share our faith and share our testimony and, and, and deliver the message of the good news to them, that they too would receive Jesus. So here's some things I want to say. Um, I want to I give you three quick points on how to start with your friends. The first one is this, pray for opportunities. Pray for opportunities. You could say it like this, pray for the one, but start here. I remember just, just waking up early and praying for the, the friends that were around me that God just open up a door of opportunity. God, I want to reach them. I want to show them. I want to give them some encouragement. God, I want to, I want to have a conversation about my faith. Lord, I want to do whatever it takes. So, so pray for opportunities to share your faith. Here's the second thing. Expect opportunities. How many, how many of you know that faith doesn't just talk or pray, but faith then moves into expectation? Did y'all, did y'all hear what I just said? Faith doesn't stay at the, just the, the confessional stage. Faith moves into the expectation stage. So now when we're praying for opportunities and we're connecting with God, our faith is built. Now we're saying, oh my gosh, God, you are, you're going to at some point provide an opportunity for me to share my faith with someone around me. So not just pray, but I'm telling you, One prayer that I just believe, I just thoroughly am convinced that God always answers is the prayer, God, open a door of opportunity for me to share the gospel with someone today. I I just believe, call me crazy, I believe God answers that prayer every single time. So we pray for opportunities, but then we expect them, and that moves to taking the opportunity. So listen, like, that's not just, oh, the opportunity is presented, and oh my gosh, oh, ah, and we run away from the opportunity. No, we take it. We take the opportunity. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. You can say two things. Number one, you can just share your testimony. Yeah, I love to share my story with someone because it's personal and it builds a relationship. Ask their story. Hey, like, what's up with you? Like, tell me, tell me about your life. And, and, and then when the opportunity provides itself, share your story. Say, hey, like, I want to tell you, like, Man, my whole life changed. Listen, I'm going to tell you, what we, all of us are, all of us have common ground in is we're all broken. And when you get to know someone, they usually would tell you pretty quickly about their brokenness. And so you can tell them about your brokenness and your spiritually disconnectedness and your fear and anxiety and depression and your addictions and bondages. And you can start with telling them your story of your own brokenness and saying, this is how Jesus has healed my heart. This is how Jesus has washed me clean. And you can share your story and just take the opportunity. The second thing you can do in taking an opportunity is invite them to church. Like as clear as that is, like, hey, I'm a Christian and um, I go to this amazing church with the best preacher ever. No, I'm just kidding. And, and why are you laughing? Uh, We go to this awesome church. It's super life-giving. It's fun. And I I would love to see you at church this Sunday or this Wednesday. And um, take the opportunity. Come on, someone shout amen. Why don't you take the opportunity? Start with your friends. Thought number two is this. Faith, we start with our friends, but faith doesn't quit. And and let let me let the text speak for a minute. Mark chapter two, verse four through five, it says, And when they could not get near him because of the crowd. First of all, can I just say what I love about Jesus is that wherever Jesus is, there's a crowd. People are coming to him. People are rushing around him. People want to hear about him. Why is it that the church today doesn't really always look like that? My prayer is that at the gathering on Wednesdays and at New Hope on Sundays, that people would practically kick open the door to get in the house of God because they can't wait to hear about Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings and the one who can change absolutely everything. May the church be packed because wherever Jesus was, the people were always crowding around him. I love that in this text. They couldn't even, they couldn't even get in the house because there was no more room and the crowd was so big. So this is what they had to do. 
they removed the roof above him. And then when they made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. This is absolutely crazy. This is resilience at its finest. This is like dynamic and creative. And the fact that they had the audacity to climb to the roof and, and pull off layers of the roof. Does anybody see like me? Like this is a little bit crazy. But, but here's the crazy thing is, is not one person, and especially not Jesus, makes, uh, makes a comment about the roof being destroyed. Like, just imagine yourself in this house, and you're in this house, and Jesus is preaching, and he starts getting excited and shouting, and people are at, at it just listening and zoned in, and all of a sudden, like, the, 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 the stuff of the ceiling starts to, to fall down and starts to, like, hit your head, and it's, it's falling, and, and, and just things start to fall from the, and then all of a sudden, like, the, the roof is opening up, and you can start to see the sunlight pouring into the house, because, oh my gosh, the roof, someone's pulling the roof off, someone's literally raising the roof, no, I'm just playing, it's a horrible joke, but some, <laughs> stupid joke, like, you know, waiting to tell it, but the, these men are, are destroying someone's property, but not one, there's not one mention of the property destruction. The only thing that's mentioned, check this out, the only thing that's mentioned is their faith. You know, you know I think sometimes we can get real religious and we can get real hard. And maybe, maybe some people, like the Pharisees that were there, were like, oh my God, I can't believe. I can't, are you kidding me? How dare someone ruin someone's property and bring down what this is absolute this is disrespectful. This is absolutely dishonoring to, to a place of worship. And, and you can check your religiousness at the door because Jesus only makes mention of their faith and says nothing about the roof. Because you know what Jesus loves? He loves when people get really creative in bringing their friends to him. He loves when you have big faith that doesn't quit to bring people to him. The reason I said faith that doesn't quit is because they could, the four friends could have said, oh, that stinks. There's no room for me. Well, we'll try tomorrow, buddy. We'll try tomorrow. We'll try tomorrow. They could have taken the fact that the house was full and they could have said, you know what, there's no room. All right, we'll, we'll try later. No worries. But these, these men didn't just have a, a, a faith that lasted up until rejection. I don't know if you heard what I just said. They didn't have a faith that, that was big up until they got rejected. They had faith that despite the rejection, despite the no that they got, Despite the get out of here that they got, they said, no, but Jesus is still in that house and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get my friend to Jesus. So we're going to climb the roof. We're going to open up the roof and put my friend down through the roof. Listen, Jesus loves big faith that gets creative and that doesn't quit at rejection. He loves when you, when you endure and have big faith that lasts and perseveres. I want to say three things real quick. We need to have compassionate faith we got to have compassionate faith. This is a, an inner brokenness that we have for the lost people around us. Listen, if we don't have brokenness and compassion for people that are without hope, I'm not totally sure that we really know Jesus. Because if we know Jesus, we are broken and are filled with compassion for those who don't know him. Does anybody hear what I'm saying tonight? Like, honestly, I think for those of us like you, that want to represent Christ and want to share our faith, you might not need more like power and authority and boldness and unction. You might just need to get more broken for people around you. I get the question all the time. What am I called to do? Like, I don't know what I'm called to do, Pastor Caleb. I don't know. And I'm like, listen, it's, it, you don't need to just ask what you're called to do. You need to ask, what are you broken for? And my prayer is that all of us would get to the place of compassion and brokenness for the lost people all around us. 
the Bible tells a story of Jesus looking at the crowds. And the Bible said he was he was filled with compassion because the people were led like they were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no one to lead them spiritually. Are, are we compa- do we have faith that is driven by compassion? I believe these four friends, they were like, we're going to do whatever it takes to get our friend because he's paralyzed and he can't walk. And, and we know a man, we know a person that can change his condition. And so we're going to do everything in our power that this man would be transformed because of Jesus' power. It was led by compassion, which leads us to creativity, a creative faith. These people got creative. They, they were a little bit scrappy. You know, I love that. I love the fact that they were scrappy. They were dynamic. They were creative with their faith. They climbed a roof and opened the roof so that they could get their faith. They just interrupted the church service. Don't you love when church service gets interrupted and makes everybody feel uncomfortable? This is interruption in church at its finest right here, ladies and gentlemen. And they got real creative real quick. They didn't take no for an answer. I remember like, being like 17 years old, a senior in high school. And I was like, man, I was so zealous. I was trying to win everybody to Jesus. I would talk to anybody at any time. And, and I remember just having conversation after conversation in the, in the lunchroom and in classroom. And, but I remember one time I was like, I want to I wanna do something that's a bit more creative. So I took a piece of paper, just eight and a half by, by what is it, eight and a half by 11. And, 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 I, and on the, the face of it, it said, it said, take what you need. Okay. It was a piece of paper like this. It said, take what you need. And, and I cut little slivers on the bottom of the paper and wrote uh, a, a different thing on each one of those slivers. You know, those things like you can take, like take, if you need landscaping, it's like, you can take the number. Anybody know what I'm talking about? This old school. We're going way back here. And on those, the, the pieces of paper, I wrote joy, peace, um, love, friendship, uh, hope, um, and I, and I wrote different things on the piece of paper. And on the back of it, it said, Jesus is the answer. I remember going back. I posted it right on the bathroom so a lot of people could see it right near the bathroom. So a lot of people could see it. And, and I remember going back, like, toward the end of the day. And every single one of those things, like, I think there was two left that were still on the paper. And people were hearing about Jesus being the answer. Hey, if you're in fear, Jesus is the answer. Hey, if you're hopeless, Jesus is the answer. If you are anxious, Jesus is the answer. If you need peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. If you need, and I was trying to get creative. Listen, some of y'all need to get creative. You need to do some creative things. Listen, you have an audience. Listen, some of y'all are so dang creative on TikTok. Some of you are crazy talented on Instagram. Like you've got the right aesthetic and the right vibe and your page looks so cute. And I'm like, man, you could do so much for the kingdom of heaven. It was just a little bit of creativity. If you would let people know about the gospel and stop being so ashamed and get Jesus. Come on, creative faith. It's creative faith. Lastly is conquering faith. Someone shout conquering. And and what I want to say about this is a lot of times I think we have faith up until we're rejected. Up until someone says, you're weird. Up until someone says, hey, get out of my face with that Jesus stuff. We have faith all the way up until someone ridicules us and refutes us and and has something contrary to say about Christ. But here's the deal. I want to say this. You need to have conquering faith. Faith that surpasses the no's that you get. Faith that moves past the, 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 you're a Jesus freak, you're weird, get out of my face. Faith that goes beyond that. I had five close friends when I was, you know, going through my stuff in life. Five, five friends, five friends that we would smoke weed together, we would fight people together, we would just, with five friends, we would get in trouble together. Five friends that I thought, well, these are my homies, these are my ride or dies. Five friends, these, these are my guys, like forever, like these are my guys. And, 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 and it was crazy because all five of them, all five of them, I wish this wasn't true, but all five of them, when I was converted to Jesus and I, and I went to them and I shared my testimony with each of them, I told them what Jesus has done for me, each one of them, five of them, every single one of them rejected me. One of them looked me in the eyes and said, I don't like this Caleb. I want the old one back. I was rejected after rejected after rejected, but I thank God that I, my faith wasn't just all the way up until I was rejected, but my faith conquered rejection. Listen, your faith needs to conquer rejection. 
Your faith needs to conquer the fear that you have. Your faith needs to conquer the inhibitions that you have. Your faith needs to surpass the little anxieties that you get. Come on. That's the kind of faith we need. If we're going to win some souls around us, we're going to see Jesus move wherever we are. Conquering faith. And lastly is this. If I can have the worship team come up, that'd be awesome. Lastly is this. Forgiveness is the greater miracle. I want to read the verses 6 through 12. It says, now some of the scribes are sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins? Come on, but God alone. They're they getting, they getting spiteful and mean. Who does this, they're thinking, who does this guy think he is? Who does this guy think he is? Talking about forgiveness of sins. Only God can forgive sins. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. He's like, <laughs> he's kind of toying with them. Hey, what, what's easier? For me to heal them? Want me to heal them? Or, or what's easier? Want me to forgive his sins? And then he's like, watch this. I'm going to validate myself. I don't need to, but I'm going to validate myself. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we've never seen anything like this. It was a physical sickness that they brought their friend to Jesus so that they would, he would heal his physical sickness. But Jesus doesn't just take care of the physical part of us. Jesus takes care of the spiritual part of us because it's the spiritual part of us that lasts forever. Although if this man, if this man did not get his sins forgiven, but got healed, who knows where he would have ended up in eternity. But I thank God that he said to him first, son, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, oh, and you're sick too? You can be healed as well. But Jesus dealt with the spiritual and then he dealt with the physical. This is what God's trying to do in the world today. He wants to deal with the souls of people. He wants to heal the souls of people. He wants to forgive the sins of people. And we ought to be like people that are like, hey, I know, I know the man that would forgive all of your sins because the greater revelation, my friend, is not that Jesus is just a miracle worker. The greater revelation is that Jesus is a forgiver of our sins. The, the, the greater miracle is in that Jesus you know, raised someone from the dead. The, the greater miracle is that Jesus died for all of us who were dead and then rose again three days later. That's the greatest miracle of all because Jesus is the forgiver of our sins. He came to forgive us. He came to take on the sins of the world. And he came to die for us. And rise again that we too can rise again forgiven and clean and whole with a brand new life that he wants to offer to us. It's the greatest miracle. Jesus is the healer and he's the savior. Jesus is the miracle worker and he's the Messiah. Jesus is the one that can fix the physical sickness, but Jesus is the one that fixes the spiritual sickness. It wasn't just that this man was physically paralyzed. It was that this man was spiritually paralyzed. And my question to you is how many people around you are spiritually paralyzed? How many people around you in the world that you're living in, how many of them are so far from God, disconnected spiritually, that don't have the knowledge of the Savior? And this is why we take our friends to Jesus. My question is this, who is on your mat? These four guys had a friend on their mat. And this mat didn't get welcomed through the door, so this mat went up to the roof. This mat was lowered to Jesus. Who's on your mat? Who is on your mat? Who are you taking to the presence of Jesus? Who are you praying for consistently every day? Who are you praying for? Who are you taking to the throne room of grace? Who are you praying that God would open up opportunities? Who are you praying for that you would share your faith with, that they too could receive eternal life and be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven that lasts forever? Who is on your mat? 
That's my prayer. That's my question. Jesus revealed to the audience that he was indeed the Messiah. He was the one the world was waiting for. The world was, the Jewish world in particular, was waiting for the Messiah to come. He was prophesied over and over again. He would come and he would make all things new. And if you know anything about Jewish tradition and history is that is, is, is in, in biblical history is that the Messiah would come and restore all things. He would make everything right. All injustice would be gone. All sadness would be gone. They were looking for the Messiah, that, but, they, but they missed Jesus who is the Messiah. Because what happens first before the restoration of all things when Jesus returns is that Jesus is remaking every single one of us and he starts with our hearts and he said, son, daughter, you are forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. This is the good news. This is the good news. And the reality is this. If you want to receive the forgiveness of sins, the Bible is so clear. It says to simply repent of your sins, confess that you're a sinner, believe in the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says that you will be saved. Believe. Repent. That's it. Say, God, I'm done with my sins. I want to follow you forever. I believe that you are Lord and Savior. You are the Messiah. I believe in you. That's what the Bible says. If you're in this room tonight, if we could bow our heads in this moment, if you're in this room tonight and you're saying, I want Jesus Christ, I want to be forgiven of my sins, and I want to know for sure that I'm forgiven of my sins. If that's you, why don't you put your hand up in this moment? Just put your hand up if there's anyone in this room. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. <laughs> hands going up. Beautiful. You can put your hands down. Let's pray this all together. No one praying by themselves. Why don't you say, Jesus, thank you for forgiving my sin. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I repent of all of it. All the darkness. Shine your light on it. I believe that you are the Savior. And I put my trust in you. In Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for the people in this room that their sins have been washed away completely by the God that loves them eternally and unconditionally. I thank you, Lord, that you're working in this place week after week. You're working. And I thank you for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. In our closing, before we have a time of worship and sing a song. I want to read this to you. Why don't you stand to your feet, though? I read this years ago, and it challenged me to the core. And I want to read it out loud to you tonight because I believe it's somewhat of a commission and somewhat of a challenge and brings me back to when I was five years old, preaching my first sermon ever. Do you believe in Jesus? Good, because if you didn't, you'd go to hell. You, know, you want to know what I left out? I left out that day when I was five years old. The sermon was incomplete. What I wish I said, yeah, you won't just not go to hell. <laughs> You'll receive heaven. You'll get the forgiveness of your sins. You'll get to know Jesus and walk with him for the rest of your existence. You will be blessed beyond measure. You will have a life full of purpose. You will have a life that you never even thought you could live according to Jesus. If you are in him, you will have more than you could ever imagine. I left that out. I left the heaven part out when I was five. But here's Charles Spurgeon, a preacher in London in the early 1900s, and he says this. Oh, my brothers and sisters in Christ, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay and not madly to destroy themselves. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let no, not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Church, it's time to pray for souls. 
It's time to pray for souls. It's time to pray for souls. It's time to pray for souls. It's time to believe that God would open up the door of opportunity, that we would step in to that opportunity and take it every single time to say, let me tell you about my person, the person that changed everything. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. I want to make it hard for people to go to hell. I want to make it nearly impossible for people that see me and have a conversation with me to go to hell. I want to make it so dang hard, but not just because of the words I say, but because of the life that I live. Let me pray for you, and then we're about to sing. Father God, every person, under the sound of my voice, I pray that you would raise us up, God, as evangelists, that, God, we would be unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save every single sinner that believes. Help us, God, not to be afraid. Help us, God, not to have inhibitions. Help us, God, not to be apathetic. God, help us not to sit on the sidelines anymore. God, help us to get on the harvest field and be someone that's used of God. God, help this whole auditorium to be filled with broken people, with sinning people, with people that are far from you, that they would be connected to you upon the gospel that they receive. Father, may this be the case in our day, in our time. Revival in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, someone shout revival. Someone shout revival in Jesus' name. Come on, worship team.